Ruby, Volume 5, Episode 8, Alone Together. What happens? The episode begins with Ruby, Weiss, and Yang talking at dawn. Blake gets brought up in conversation, Yang gets mad and storms off. We then cut to Blake getting a secret letter from Ilya, and then we jump back to Yang. Weiss shows up to comfort Yang and ends up just talking about her own backstory for a bit and explaining Blake's character motivations. Luckily, this ends up helping Yang feel better. Back at Menagerie, Blake meets up with Ilya and gets ambushed. Ilya gives us her character motivations, admits to having a crush on Blake, and leaves. Blake calls in Sun and stops the two nobodies who's got her tied up. The two run back to Blake's house as the attack on the Belladonna Mansion has already begun. So this looks unbelievably like sunset, rather than sunrise. It's the warm look of everything. Sunsets are warm colored, sunrises are cool colored. Which is ultimately not really important, but I just wanted to point that out. Everyone's performances during this first scene kinda sucks. They're all just so wooden and awkward that the overly saccharine sweet dialogue sounds ingenuine. It's like the entire amateur cast are only able to give a believable performance if they're supposed to be angry or sad. Happier calm line reads all sound like they've never heard the emotion before. I guess acting gets hard when you can't overact for all your lines. And on top of all that, no one sounds like they're having a real conversation. The dialogue is so stilted, it takes so long for anyone to speak up after another character finishes, and everyone's performance is so wooden that I become very aware that these lines were not recorded together. It's obvious that each voice actress was totally alone, not listening to someone else speak as they recorded their lines. It ends up feeling like I'm not listening to the girls have a conversation, I'm just listening to Barbara, Kara, and Lindsay read their scripts aloud. Barbara especially really dropped the ball for this episode. I don't know what happened. She went from being one of the more impressive actors of the main cast to one of the worst between volumes. It's like she's reading the script for the first time, or like she's not being given any direction. Yang's half-hearted line reads sounds like Barbara's recordings were rushed out. Are you kidding me right now? Whoa, 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 whoa. For so vehemently not wanting coffee, Ruby sure does seem to like it back there. This conversation is so dull, because it's too easy to see coming. Now, that doesn't mean I want surprising conversations in the show, but rather I want the dialogue to feel thought out, rather than being the first thing the writers come up with like how it seems. This show is so easy to predict because you just have to go with the first thing you think of for any given scenario, which is then compounded with lackluster writing and unbelievable performances. And you know, I get the feeling I'm being awfully hard on this scene. But by this point, Ruby has been running for five years. This is the 60th episode of the series. But the quality is worse than most of Volume 1. The animation improves every year, but the writing and performances feel like first drafts stapled into the final product. These actors and this company have done better than this in the past. There's no excuse for this level of quality to be in the show. I guess I'm just tired of seeing the show do so poorly when we've seen it do so well before. Wouldn't it have been awkward if Blake hadn't have found Ilya's letter? In all honesty, while this bit is real short, it's also much better than the ham-fisted first scene. It established the next step in Blake's adventure, and there's so little dialogue that the writing can't get on my nerves. I also kind of love the fact that there are nocturnal faunas. That's a cute touch. I sure am glad Dad gave me this drawing of my team. He's such a good artist. Like, this still doesn't look like a photograph, and I will never let that go. I'm glad that it's Weiss that talks to Yang. One, because this means I don't have to listen to Ruby's annoying ass voice for the whole scene. Can a girl read her comics in peace? Two, because it makes way more sense for Weiss to talk to Ying about beef with Blake than Ruby. And three, because we never get to see these two together. When Weiss and Yang first reconnected, I was really excited to get to see the two of them adventure together. Blake and Ruby never really interact, and neither do Yang and Weiss, and I thought it'd be fun to see their dynamics. But instead, Weiss and Yang had one conversation with Raven and then immediately met back up with Ruby. So while I was disappointed we didn't get to see more of Weiss and Yang traveling together, this scene was a nice replacement for that. Sort of. The shoddy performances continue into the scene, and the animation is so minimal that it can be easy to mistake some shots as still images. But that's not what I want to focus on. It's the writing that grinds my gears here. You don't need to have your character's monologue to get a point across. Yang just goes into this pre-planned speech about how her life is hard and why she's sad. There's no need for this. We know why she's sad. Weiss knows why she's sad. She's just recapping more shit we know and for what? To give Weiss a good lead-in for her pre-planned monologue. Everything Yang says is just to lead Weiss into a good counter-argument. There's no character in her lines, to the point that she calls her dad by his first name for no reason. Ty was always busy with school and Ruby couldn't even talk yet. If all you're doing with your character's lines is leading into someone else's lines, then you are not doing it right. People speak because they have something to say, and in a scripted scene like this one, then that means that every time a character speaks, there must be a reason for it. 
Otherwise, you're wasting your animation effort and your audience's time. The writers clearly had no reason for Yang to say anything here, because she has no topic to stay on. She starts by standing her ground on being upset over Blake, which is good. That's the reason she's upset, that's the reason Weiss came to talk to her. Yang hasn't changed her mind yet, so Weiss can talk to her with a conflicting opinion, leading to a discussion. Events happen in stories because of conflict. But then Yang jumps into abandonment issues. This steers away from the topic at hand. Now Yang is simply speaking with no reason. Her talking about her mom leaving adds nothing to the conflict of being upset at Blake. It does explain Yang's stance on the matter, mom left me so I have issues with abandonment, but it's not something that needs to be explained to the audience and certainly not to Weiss. Furthermore, Yang compares her family life to Weiss for no real reason except so that Weiss can have a way to prove Yang wrong later. Why would Yang choose to bring up Weiss's family when she knows so little about it? And it's unconnected to either of Yang's new topics. Weiss's family life has nothing to do with Blake and barely connects to Yang's mom. Yang brings up dinners to attend and recitals to perform at, as if those are things intrinsically connected to having a mother figure. Of course Yang didn't have any of that, and it's not because Raven left. The writers flaccidly try to connect Weiss's luxurious events to Yang's lack of mother figure without thinking about how those topics are completely unrelated. This then leads into Weiss's monologue. Now, Weiss had fought with Blake before. Blake had run away because of her, and Weiss developed off-camera around that event. After the finale of Volume 1, we see that Weiss and Blake are clearly closer friends, implying that they've gotten over their differences. Weiss has been in Yang's shoes before, and could easily bring up those past grievances with Blake to help talk Yang through her issues. But instead, she just talks about her mom. By this point, the original topic that was set up in the previous scene, Yang's mad at Blake, has been completely dropped in favor of having Weiss and Yang connect over their shitty mothers. Why set up the mad at Blake shit if you're just gonna push it aside in the follow-up scene? Not only is this an incompetent story structure, but the writing is also some of the most amateurish I've heard come out of this show. Both monologues feel very scripted and overly planned out. No one talks like this. No one has a full two-minute story prepared for whenever you need to give some boring backstory. Especially one with so many superfluous facts as Weiss. Why bring up your dad admitting to marrying your mom for her name? Why mention it was your birthday? Having Weiss confide in Yang these things is fine in theory, but it's just more disconnected tidbits that ultimately do nothing to further the conversation. Weiss's point, and the part they focus on, is her mom's alcohol dependency. Bring up her shit dad at a more appropriate time when the characters choose to act upon that knowledge, rather than simply using it to pout out Weiss's monologue. If your goal is to have Weiss discuss her mom, then start with that. Don't waste time with her dad or her birthday. But more importantly, this shouldn't have been discussed at all. We just spent an entire volume with Weiss at her house, with her family, including her mom. Rather than force-feeding us this boring-as-balls backstory through a slow-ass speech, fucking show us how her mom behaves. A simple scene last volume could have gotten the message across loud and clear, but instead the writers chose to have Mrs. Schnee absent from the volume just to bring her up now like she's supposed to matter. This is a visual medium. Rather than have your characters sit still and tell each other shit, just animate it actually happening. I've never experienced a show that would so much prefer telling the audience shit over just putting it on screen. But I guess that would have taken too long to animate, now wouldn't it? Better just have no one move for all the fucking volume. And all this also means that once again, the spotlight has been stolen away from Yang. Yang has never been our primary focus for the show. She barely contributed to the first volume to the point that she was excluded from the finale along with Weiss, who had been a major player throughout the rest of the volume. Her semblance finally got explained to us in volume 2, but she was only able to hit the paladin because of Ruby and Weiss's ice flower move. She then lost to Neo just to get saved by Raven, the real focus of that scene. She got an after credit scene that's been forgotten and ignored. She beat Flint and Neon because of Weiss's sacrifice. She finally got her time to shine by breaking Mercury's leg, just for Blake to steer the conversation away from that to instead focus on her relationship with Adam. Yang lost an arm, but that was put aside to focus on Pyrrha's death. Once it came time to show Yang grow out of her depression with her new arm, we just jumped over her arc. Yang finally finds her mom and then lampshades that to insist on being taken to Ruby, which in turn is also put aside to focus on how Raven can turn into a bird. And now finally we get to see Yang deal with her rocky relationship with her closest friend, instead we put the emphasis on Weiss's alcoholic mother. It's like the writers are doing everything they can to keep Yang in the background. And then finally, after two minutes of needless backstory and monologuing, the characters get back on topic. And the writer's solution to this conflict? Just tell Yang Blake's character motivations. Weiss's argument for Blake sounds more like an excerpt from a wiki than anything else. I like the statement of 
What if I needed her here for me? We've finally reached the center of Yang's issues around Blake, and offers a new perspective for Blake to think about once they all reconnect. I ran so people won't hurt you. I want you to hate me so you'll be safe. Blake, the only one that really hurt me was you when you left. It's just a shame we had to meander around this topic for so long, choosing to spend our screen time on problem parents over the relationship of our core cast. From this point on into the conversation, the writing and performances really pick up. The characters stay on topic without simply spouting wiki articles at each other. Weiss approaches the topic in a way that feels genuine to her character, allowing the viewer to become invested in the story. It makes me wonder why the writers chose to have the mom-based monologues at all, when once the character stayed on topic, the product became overall more enjoyable. Everyone, it's our new major character again, Yuma! And two other people. Wow, I'm blown away by how good these performances are. After slogging through directionless Yang and Preachy Weiss, Blake and Ilya's conversation is a breath of fresh air. They emote, believably. There aren't huge pauses between characters. Whoever was in charge of Menagerie's direction should take over for the whole show, because at least with Blake's story, it doesn't sound like I'm listening to people read their scripts for the first time. The script is also a major plus here. This argument doesn't sound nearly as pre-planned or over-scripted as the previous conversations of the episode. I'm actually enjoying the scene. What a concept. Good writing, good direction, and good performances lead to having a good time watching your show. So, Ilya's confession feels a little out of left field, but I don't really care. Her having a crush on Blake adds a new level of dimension to their relationship that offers a lot of interest to their story. I don't know why the creators are so motivated to give Blake as many love interests as possible, but that's not important right now. I also love how she blushes with her freckles. Great animation and acting. 10 out of 10. Why the heck doesn't Sun ambush Ilya before she leaves for the Belladonna house? Tussle here in the alley to help keep Gira and Kali safe. I mean, like, Ilya and Yuma ultimately don't really do anything at the mansion, but Blake and Sun don't know that. Why would they go about this assassination like this? Kill the Belladonnas so the Faunus go to Adam. Got it. That means wearing our blatantly white fang outfits, specifically the ones in Adam's branch of the organization, and loudly shoot up the Belladonnas place. Fucking what? What, did he not have his aura up? Had it already broken? Why didn't he heal himself then? Your rules for aura sucks and makes no sense. What? Do the Belladonnas just hire guards who have no aura? This is so distracting. Why would you take off your coat? You just like wearing thick leather with fur casually, even though you live on a hot-ass tropical island? It has a giant dumb shoulder pad on it, but you just fucking removed it! You're in combat! Why the fuck do you have the ugly-ass shoulder pad if not for protection during combat? What are you doing?! I would be more excited by the prospect of this fight, except that I know that they use this fight as a cliffhanger again next episode. But we'll discuss these egregious cliffhangers at a different time. And so, that was Alone Together, and like, I'm annoyed. Because when I first watched this episode, I really liked it. I remember talking to my friend about it and specifically mentioning how much I liked Weiss and Yang's conversation. I had praised how even though there had been so much sitting and talking so far in the volume, it had worked for the slower, calmer mood necessary for the scene. But then they pointed out how it's just Weiss talking about her mom and it ruined it for me. And so, yeah, I like the scene conceptually. Weiss and Yang sit down to go over Yang's problems with Blake, but in practice it's just too overly scripted monologues about an unrelated topic. And I think this happens a lot in Ruby, where fans will love something from the show without realizing that the concept of the scenario is often better than the actual execution of it. Back onto the topic of Alone Together, it's a shame that such powerful moments were sullied by lackluster writing and performances. The first half of the episode drags on and on, and the clunky work of the actresses makes it hard to sit through. Luckily for the episode, it ends really well. Everyone seemed to start caring again once the halfway mark had been reached. If you're willing to sit through the slow-ass dialogue of the first half, then you're in for a treat as the episode winds down. However, if you ask me, I think I'd suggest just skipping everything until the last six minutes. If you've seen it once, then there's no need to force yourself to sit through the boring-ass beginning again. Well, fortunately, coffee exists. <laughs>